praise for each and every one of you this morning, and thank you for being in the house of worship. I pray your week has been going well, and we pray the Lord will bless us as we spend time in the Word of God. If you will, grab your Bibles this morning, and let's get to 2 uh, Timothy. 2 Timothy. Timothy chapter 2. Amen. So Timothy chapter 2. Praise God. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. I'm sure we're going to back it down just a little bit, brother. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. It reads. Like this, but God, God's firm foundation stands bearing his seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ, the name, the name of the Lord, depart from iniquity. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some of, for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Last verse. So flee youthful lust, or youthful passions, King James says lust, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about why holiness matters. Yes. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, we come so humbly before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, because you've been so mighty and so good in our lives. And we owe you all the glory and all the honor. That word, Hosanna, God, we, you should be praised in so many different ways. Yes. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. God, we approach your pre the preaching of you today. Asking for your grace and your mercy as we declare your word. God, that you help us understand your holiness. That you help us understand, God, how you feel about this subject. Lord, please let heaven invade this message, Lord God. That it might be impressed on our hearts. Not just our minds, but our hearts, Lord. That it may bring forth transformation. Lord, I thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Why holiness matters. Holiness is not a denomination. Holiness is not a denomination. The word holiness is the same as the word sanctification. It means to be set apart from sin, and but it's set apart for God's use. It's to be set apart from something, but also to be set apart and aside for something. God sets us apart. And he puts us in a place where he can use us. Let it be no mistake that the reason God saved you was not just so you could miss hell and populate heaven. That's a good benefit. That's great. I thank goodness for the end of days. But if we'll be faithful, we'll hold out to the end. There is a place called heaven that awaits us. But between salvation and heaven... God, when he saved us, his main purpose is so that he could use you and I. His job, his purpose for you is that you and I would be more and more like Jesus, not so that we can say we like Jesus, but our lives would be demonstrate that quality of Jesus. People need the love of Christ, and the Lord wants to show the love of Christ through you and through me. People need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Lord wants the gospel to come out through you and through me. The Lord wants whole families and, and, and husbands and wives to stay together and, and to show what uh, commitment and love and unity looks like. So what he has done, he has deputized us Christians to be full of love and compassion, to be committed over feeling whether being you're madly in love or not. I don't want to get off track, but I can stay there for a moment that marriage is even is deeper than whether or not you're in love. Sometimes, you know, the love knob gets turned real low. Amen. 
And the last thing you got on the table is commitment. That's what's yeah. keeping the train moving. And so God says, listen, I need these representatives on earth. And, and what, I, what I need them for is so that they can show forth my word, show forth my love, just, just live a Christian life. And that's where this word holiness comes into play. It's this setting apart from sin, from something, setting apart to something. It's not a denomination. It's not about clothing. It's not about uh, uh, earrings. It's not about the things we put on the outside. Because I don't care what you put on the outside. If the inside has not been changed, you, right. you, you still got a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so it doesn't matter about that. I, I'm not concerned who comes in looking like what. You will see an outward change when there's been an inward change. Yeah. Right. So let's deal with this issue of holiness. That holiness is being set apart. God has made us holy so we could uh, become servants who serve in His service. Amen. We are here to serve God. We're here to serve one another. And so in order to do that, God has called us holy. I want to drop three things on you, of course, that will help navigate through this, these four passages here so we can have an understanding as to what holiness means and why it matters. It should matter to us. Why it should matter to us. Why holiness should matter to us. It should matter, number one, because God, uh, God separates us in the heart. That God separates us in the heart. Verse 19 is going to open this up for us quickly as we get into it. God separates us in the heart. Uh, it says, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ, the name of the Lord, depart from iniquity. God separates us in our heart. Church, first of all, God, what he does is he separates us spiritually. There's a spiritual separation here. For there's the foundation. The Lord knows those who are his, church. Yes. The Lord knows all those of us who are true Christians indeed, who profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you ask Christ to come into your life, God gave us this spiritual separation according to Colossians uh, chapter 1, 12, and 14. He says, well, we were trans translated out of the kingdom of darkness and placed over into the kingdom of light. We have been pulled out of sin, out of being in bondage to sin. Even if you've got an issue with sin right now, sin does not have a dominion over you because... God, when you said Jesus come into my life, he pulled you out of that and he placed you in sonship with Jesus Christ. So he brings this spiritual separation. You, your location, your physical, loca your physical location may not have changed, but your spiritual location has changed. Yes. Your spiritual destiny has changed. You were on, I, let me speak for me, I was on my way yes. to a burning hell. Yes. But the Lord Jesus saved me, yes. called Thank me out Lord. of that, and then he yes. took me from my slavery ways and placed me in sonship with Jesus Christ, God Almighty in heaven. Amen. That's Amen. good news this Amen. Sunday morning. Man, that'll help you live good yes. with God because you see he gives us this spiritual separation. Yes. That's what he does. God, God, God brings separation in our hearts, but not only is this spiritual separation where he moves us uh, location, uh, spiritually, but then there's this personal separation. Uh, the because of that text says, but uh, he says, but let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So, so stay with me, church. Here's what happens. He separates us spiritually from this life of sin, and now we have Christ inside of us. But then he says, listen, that separation that has happened, that salvation that has come, you know what it produces? It should produce us turning away from things that are ungodly. Amen. Listen to me now. He says there's this personal separation. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart. That means it's, it's, it's an act of us purposely and willfully seeing what's evil and saying, God, I don't want to participate in that. That's right. And every time it comes my way, even if I like it, Lord, I need your help. I'm asking for your grace and your mercy and your power to depart from things, watch this, that will hinder our relationship with God Almighty. Amen. Amen. Not only those things that hinder our relationship with God, but did you know some things, sin that we get into will hurt us even physically, yes. mentally, emotionally. He wants us to have personal separation. First Peter says this, but you, we are a chosen 
race, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you have, may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into this marvelous light. God has separated us in our hearts, church. He says, listen, I have called you out of the world and into my kingdom. Yes. That's good news. He yes. does it. He does it, church, so that we can be children that he can use. Yes. And sometimes God can't use us because we're not separated for his glory. God can't use us because even though we say we're separated in the heart, personally, there's no separation, no visible separation. There's nothing that looks like what we say we're professing or what we're possessing. This is vitally important for us as we look at this matter of holiness. It's, holiness is important because God separates us in our hearts. Yes. We are God's servants because he has separated us. But not only has he separated us in our hearts, church, but God selects us with his hand. God selects us with his hand. Verse 20 uh, opens that up for us and, and talks to us about unusable vessels. Because the text says this, now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. In this particular passage, he says there are vessels, people, individuals that are in. It's really a, uh, an illustration in a house. You know, it's your house. You've got uh, utensils that you use. You've got, the, you've got the paper plates and the stuff you use every day. And then you have maybe you've got the china sitting in the cabinet, the porcelain, the nice stuff that's just for special occasions. And if you like me, I got something that's sitting on my table, uh, in my dining room table. We don't even use it. It's just pure decoration. It's just pure decoration. We don't eat off of it. We have to wash it every now and then because it gets dusty. It's just pure decoration. Well, he says in, in a house, in a great house, or in the kingdom, he says there are people just like that. There are people that are set aside for special use, like the china that's in the cabinet. There are people who are... Uh, who become vessels that are like paper plates and, and plastic forks and spoons. They're used and tossed away quickly. And then there are those, those dishes you use every day. You know, they, they, they're, they're sturdy. You need to use them. You don't throw them away. They're good to use every day. He says those kinds of vessels are in uh, this thing called the kingdom. And, and Paul has to point out to his son of the faith about this particular issue that even in God's kingdom and even in the church of God that there are those who are unusable vessels. Yes. They're, they're not worth the whole lot. Matter of fact, he, he, he has to point out a couple of them. It's in verse 16 in this same chapter. He says, but avoid irreverent babble, verse 16, for, if, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hermanius and Philetus. Who have, swer who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. Paul takes a moment to explain, to give illustration for two folk, two people who have become unusable vessels. They are causing trouble in the body of Christ. Reverend, what kind of trouble? Why? What's, what's the issue here? Paul has to talk to his son in the faith about, listen to this, false teaching. False teaching that produces a false belief. When you and I believe things that are not in God's word, it can produce some wrong living. When you and I believe things that the world tells us and they attach half a scripture with it and we live on it like it's gospel, it will produce some faulty beliefs and faulty living in our lives. Yes. And some who think they're okay with God are not even in fellowship with God because we have we all, we continually rebel against Him. But somebody says if you go to church it'll be okay. But that's not the sum total of it. It's, it's when you give your heart to Him and follow Him yes. that you know everything's alright. Yes. You know, after I got married at the altar, now, now he, he's where the problem would lie. Now, if I got married, the day I got married, 2004, uh, 2004, June the 5th, 2004. <laughs> now, if I got married 2005, 
and my bride never came home with me, that'd be a problem. If I got married, we, she never came, we never talked to each other again, we never saw each other again, that, that would be a problem. We may say we're married, but something, there, there's a real problem. But everything worked out. I got her and took her home with me, and everything's been good ever since. Listen, you can say you profess, you possess something, but if there's never any evidence of what you possess, there's a problem. Amen. Something isn't right. I don't care what you say, I don't care what you believe. If your life is not changing, you have to wrestle with why am I, have I, am I really following Jesus Christ? Have I really committed, surrendered myself to where, listen, he is in control of my life. Right. If, if your life doesn't, it looks out of control, if your life looks like you're not following the Lord, if it's full of sin, you have to get real with yourself and ask the question, God, what's going on in my heart? Am I really, truly saved? And so he, he has to point out two individuals that did that. They, they came into the church and started preaching something crazy, started preaching this false doctrine. And, and Paul tells his son of the faith, here's what's going to happen. He says, here's what false teachers do and false truth. It leads to ungodly living, is what he said. He said, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Listen, whenever you, that's why I try to tell you, man, stay in your Bible church. Read some scriptures. Get an understanding of God's word. Because just because somebody posts a scripture on Facebook, man, that don't mean it's in the right context. That doesn't mean it's, it's right for your situation. Just because they post a, a half a scripture, that doesn't mean it's, it's, it's biblical. Read God's word for yourself so you won't be deceived in thinking maybe your lifestyle that you think is questionable is okay because someone else says it's okay. You understand what I'm saying? So he says, listen, false truth leads to ungodliness. That, that's why they're unusable vessels. Not only does false truth lead to ungodliness, but false truth spreads like sickness. Verse 17, he says, their talk will spread like gangrene. Man, when gangrene is in the body, you got you to gotta right. Matter of fact, that's what I'm going to say. When gangrene is in the, in the toe, it's got to go. The toe, no, the toe is gone. If the toe, if they don't amputate the part that has the sickness, the sickness will spread through the entire body and you'll die from the sickness. So you have to decide which is better to have. A sick body, which you will ultimately die sooner or later, sooner probably than later, or to be walking around with nine toes instead of ten toes. See, people make the right choice all the time. You, 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 so, so he says, sickness, he says, false truth, funky believing, uh, 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 not understanding the scriptures. He said, you can start living on that stuff and it'll turn into a sickness. And if you don't get that belief straight, you'll start living like that. And it'll, you know what it'll do? It'll make you even more sick. Because you, in your heart, you know something's wrong, but you listen to this one or that one say, it's okay, it's cool, we're doing it, I'm doing it, man, people are doing it and getting away with it. But God says, but how do you feel on the inside? How's your relationship with me on the inside, day to day? If the truth be told, how do you feel about yourself and your walk with Christ Jesus? And you, you just can't ignore it. He says false truth. These false people who are, who are, who are making things up and and, and Turning the truth, they're unusable vessels. And then finally says, false truth causes confusion. He says, who have swerved from the truth saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. Amen. And some are no longer faithful because somebody has been telling them some crazy stuff. That's, that's what an unusable servant is. But then here's this usable servant, he says. He says that God selects us with his hand for service. There are those who are unusable, but there are those who are usable. Yes. It's in verse 21. Let me give you four qualities of a usable servant. Here they are. They're number one, honorable. He says in verse 21, he said, but now in a great house they are, on, they are not only vessels of gold and silver, but there are, there, are, uh, uh, there are vessels of gold and silver. They're honorable vessels. Vessel, vessels that are for honorable use, for special use. There are vessels that God says, I'm going to use one day. Not only that, but they're holy. These vessels, you and I, who are being born again, we are set apart for God as holy. We are set apart. That means God says, I got this one, and, and, and I'm going to use that one, and, and nobody else can can use you. I, I'm going to use you. God has set us apart for himself as holy. When God sets something apart, it becomes holy. Yes. 
when God says, I'm calling this brother into the ministry, it becomes holy. When God says, I'm, when you say, I'm giving, I'm going to give this, we're going to give our marriage to the Lord and we're going to honor God, God sets it apart as holy because it's separated for him. I got to move quickly, listen. In the Bible, the Bible says when Achim, in Joshua, when Achim uh, sinned, he went and stole some stuff that God said, don't take from the enemy. God said, God said, I want you to go in there and destroy everything. Don't take no idols, don't take no beasts, don't take nothing. Leave it all there. And Achan goes in there and he sees some stuff and says, surely I can at least take 10% of this. And he goes in there, he takes something and he goes and hides it in his tent. And, and the Bible says that when they go to battle, they lose the battle because God said to Joshua, there's sin in the camp. What had happened was Achan took something that belonged to God. God said, don't touch it because all the spoils that, that were left there, it belonged to the Lord. When God says something is his, it becomes holy. That means you and I can't touch it. Can't mess with it because it belongs to the Lord. And so it is with our lives. Not only are we holy, but we become helpful. Verse, uh, the same verse says, we're useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Usable vessels. And then finally we're handled. We're ready for every good work. We're on time. He's, he can use us at any time, any place, anywhere, no matter what's going on. Because Not because you're sinless perfected or you're perfect, but because you're living a life open for the Lord to use. And when he says straighten up, you, you, you strive to straighten up. But when he, when he speaks to your heart, you're open. When he speaks to obey, you say, Lord, I'll, I'll give it my best. All that I can. And that makes you and I usable servants. Can you say amen? Amen. And then finally notice this. Not only usable. He's, God separates us in the heart. And God selects us with his hands. But finally God stamps us holy. God stamps us as holy. When I got ordained to the ministry in uh, August of 2012. Uh, Pastor Nixon. Uh, who I'm, I'm hoping to have him speak. Come and speak to us this year. Working on that. Pastor Nixon, one of his points to me was, he said, he, he did the reference, he said, son, stamped on your forehead is holiness unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Stamped on your forehead is holiness unto the Lord. God stamps on us a sense of holiness. Mm -hmm. And he, he tells us, listen, um, we just can't live the way the world lives. Mm -hmm. We just can't. You say, Reverend, I want to. So, let, you, let's be real. Sin is awesome at the time. Let's be real. It's enjoyable. It's enjoyable. It's pleasurable. Sometimes disobeying God is more exciting than obeying God. Sometimes disobeying God, watch this now, seems to work out better than disobeying God. I mean, than obeying God. Because sometimes when you obey God, it takes seem like it takes him a long time to, to send the dividends back when you're obedient. Now, Lord, I, I was Lord, I was good last week, man. You ought to come bless me this week, Lord. Lord, I didn't mess up the other week. Now I'm looking this month about thirty if you come through for me, because I was good. I made the church at least twice this month, Lord. I'm looking for a, a payback or something. Well, 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 sin is 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 enjoyable, but I tell you, church. It doesn't help us in our walk with God. Amen. Listen to me. We fall short sometimes. We miss the mark of God. But God doesn't, God doesn't throw us away. True. He works with us still. Why? Because we're his children. <laughs> but that doesn't negate him giving us some standards to walk by. Some standards to live by. Why is that, church? Because God needs you and he needs me. Okay? He needs you and he needs me. Okay, one more illustration. You do not want your physician to practice on you and he has a mechanic's license. He don't have a, 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 a medical license. He has a mechanic's license. We got a situation that's about to happen here because he may mistake my heart for an engine. I don't want him the, the, the engine for the heart. I don't know what he might be thinking, but he don't know that the mechanics are different. You want somebody who has, who has, listen, who knows the standards of the heart, who knows the standards of blood, who knows the standards of, of sugar in your blood. You want somebody who knows 
about 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 this body. Well, God says, I want to use you, but I've got to have people who have a standard as it relates to serving me. And so he says, listen, here's three ways that you and I, I got on the screen, that you and I can stay focused, that you and I can live out this standard, that you and I can stay usable, that you and I can allow this holiness of God to, listen, make us to be vessels that God can use. It's right here on the, on the screen. He says, what we ought to do, we ought to flee, we ought to follow, and we ought to fellowship. Mm -hmm. He says, number one, we flee. Look at verse 22. If you have your Bible still open, your app is still on. He says, listen, so flee youthful passions, he says. Or another translation says youthful lust. The New Living Translation says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. The Easy Reader Version says, stay away from the evil things a young person like you typically wants to do. He says, what, what he says is, listen, as, uh, I, let me put it this way. A six-year-old lying has different consequences than a 30-year-old telling a lie. Um, a 10-year-old stealing has different consequences than an 18-year-old stealing. Uh, it, it, it ain't cute. It, it, it's not a lot of slap on the wrist. It comes a harsher penalty. What he says is, listen, those youthful things that you and I uh, sometimes desire to do, he says, listen, they, those things that are evil, he says, flee from it. Yeah. Don't bargain with it. You can't tame it. You got to run from it. Yeah. Here's a biblical example. The Bible says that Joseph, remember he was caught in Potiphar's house trying to do his, trying to do his stuff, trying to do his thing. And then Mrs. Potiphar strolls up on him and that wanted to be his midnight nurse. And the Bible says he did not bargain with her, no more than to tell her, I cannot do this thing. And he ran. Yes. I've learned over the years, especially when it comes to our sexual temptations, you you got to run. You, you, you can't even pray over it. You can't even, you can't let, don't, definitely don't lay hands on nothing. You got to just run. Why? Because man, because that, because it's, it, this sin is strong. Temptation is strong. And, 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 it, and, and he says in us as human beings is this youthfulness to, um, just, again, think about youth again. My son, he's still, he's in the phase now of telling me no. Oh, yeah. And the other day, he, I, he, I said no to him, and he laid on the floor, cried. He just, ah, oh, and he dropped to the floor, cut up. That's okay now, kind of. But let him be 30 years old, you know, trying to have a tension tantrum because he's not getting his way. Listen, we do that sometimes. Because we want our way. He said, that's what he's saying. He says, avoid or flee from those youthful lusts, those youthful passions. Oh, I want it now. I got to have it. And so we mm, go get it. We deny logic and responsibilities and we go get it. And what he said, look, he said, run from that kind of behavior. Run from that kind of behavior. Flee from it. Don't play around with it. You know, don't even mess around with it. You tempted to do something that is way out of bounds in God's will. He said, man, don't play with it. Don't even make jokes about it. Flee from it. Because he says it, what you do is you're keeping yourself to be a vessel that God can use. Not only that, he says, listen, but not only flee, but follow. You pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace is what he says. Listen, church, not only are we running from something, but we're running to something. Yes. You tell me you're born again Christian, man, you ought to be in God's house. You said you, you've run from that old life. Listen, you got to run to somewhere that has life and life abundantly. Yes. You get, I, I, I can't understand people who don't want to, but who say they love God, but want to be God. There's, listen, there's some false thinking you have in your mind and your heart. You say, Reverend, I ought to be able to just, isn't going to heaven enough? Isn't just believing Jesus exists enough? No. It's enough where you begin to follow him. Yes. You follow what he says. Yes. I believe him so much, I follow what he says. Yes. I believe the Lord more than I believe the doctor. Because the doctor says, I got some stuff I got to get straightened out. And I, I've been procrastinating. I, you, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, right. I, you and I must believe God in the same way that, listen, whatever God says, he can do. Yes. And if God says he'll bless you because you're faithful, God will bless you for faithful. Amen. God says I'll use you if you make yourself available. God will use you if you make yourself available. Amen. This has nothing to do with being perfect. This has everything to do with saying, Lord, use me. Yes. 
Right. I'm willing, Lord, for you to use me. Because you're going to fall along the way. Have I got a witness here? You're going to make some mistakes along the way. Have I got a witness right here? Yeah. You're going to get it right for several months, and then there's one particular day you woke up on the wrong side of possibly somebody else's bed, and, and things just <laughs> not going for <right. laughs> <laughs> you make some mistakes, but here, but but God uses us because we still keep making ourselves available for Him. So, so, so He says, "Listen to this now. Follow." He says, "Righteousness. Pursue it. Pursue it. Actively go after it. Actively." We talked about that, and uh, we talked about spiritual growth Wednesday night. Actively look to grow. Actively read your Bible. Actively search for God. Actively pray. I mean, you pursue. Nobody can do this thing for you. Nobody can make your life turn around but you and God. Nobody can make things better for you except you and the Lord. you got to actively go get it. You have to actively engage with God. You've got to actively talk to yourself and talk to your spirit. And, and, and don't let nobody see you, but slap yourself if you got to and say, Boy, get in gear. Get it together. We've got somewhere to go. God wants to use us. Maybe the disservice maybe us preachers have done over the years is made a calling and being used of God only pulpit regulated. When in actuality, God says, I need to use you on the job that you're at today. Yes. I need to use you in your own four walls of your... I need to use you. I only made one of you. Nobody else has your DNA. Can you believe that? Amen. Nobody else has the same print, imprint as you. Nobody has you. There's only one of you that God created, and God's got an assignment for you, tailor-made just for yes. you. Yes. That's right. So God says, listen, listen, I made you... But I, I cannot use you if you don't at least try to come to my standards here. Flee from youthful lust, but follow. He says, pursue this righteousness. That means do all we can to, to pursue right living. Not only that, he says, but follow faith. Talk about being faithful. Being faithful to God. Pursue faithfulness. He says also pursue love. Being loving and love lovable. Mm -hmm. And then he also says be peace. You follow peace. That means being peaceful and being a peacemaker. Yes. And then finally, as a close, listen to this. He says fellowship. We flee, we follow, but we fellowship. Look what he says, verse 22 again. He says, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You see that? Mm -hmm. Fellowship, along. Do all those things, watch this, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. He said, fellowship with people who are fleeing just like you. Fellowship with people who are following Christ just like you will follow Christ. He says, listen, that's what we got to do. Those are three things. Those are, that's the application for today because he stamped us holy. He says, surround yourself with people. I said it last Sunday. Surround yourself with people who are trying to do and trying to go the same direction you're trying to go. You can take that spiritual and on a, on a natural perspective, your secular job, or whatever career you got in your life. You always surround your people who are doing it better than you. I watched that. My wife would always talk about her tennis days, and she would play. She was on the women's team, and she would play with some of the men on the men's team because they served the ball a lot harder than some of the women did. And they were they were really running her up and down the court. But it increased her skill level to where she could become the CIAA champ in her division. Why? Because she surrounded herself with people that could do it better than she could. But they were doing the same thing she was doing. You can't surround yourself with people that are doing the same thing you are doing. Amen. You can't surround yourself with people like that. No, that doesn't mean you're better than anybody. That means, listen to what I'm saying. If you are fleeing and they are staying, you got a problem. If you want to do right, but they are not interested, and they want to stay in the lifestyle they are, but still call themselves Christian, that's their business. But let me tell you something. You got no business with them. 1 Corinthians 15 and 33, Paul says, listen to this. He says, don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Yes. 
Bad company rules good morals. You say, Reverend, well, how can the Christ, if we say to ourselves, how do we affect the world? Let me tell you something. You can affect the world, but you cannot allow the world to affect you. Amen. Right. Amen. And if where you are is going to affect you, you got to separate. Amen. You got to learn how to build. Listen, it's okay that we're in the world, but not of the world. It's okay to be in the world with people. You got to work. You got to go to school. That's fine. But listen to me, church. Listen, when the world, your people, your work, who you hang around starts changing your attitude, starts changing your behavior, starts bringing out things in you that, man, you thought that thing was dead and cold and you were show saved, but now you find yourself tempted to go back. You need to separate yourself and begin to fellowship with people who have like faith with you, who are trying to go in the same direction you're trying to go into. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Holiness is important, church, because God has separated us in the heart. God has selected us with his hands, but God has stamped us holy as unto the Lord. And so we must flee, we must follow, and we must fellowship. Yes. Again, I hope this is not legalistic. And I hope I'm not presenting myself as something perfect. I, I have my own struggles. Man, we were, we were digging into some stuff yesterday, just a little bit, because it's not about sinless perfection. It's not about that. It's about seeking God. Let's say this. It's not about what you have done. It's about what you are doing. You say, Reverend, I'm saved. And I ask you, well, where are you in your salvation today? Were your best days, have they gone by? I'm going to tell you something. You need to be concerned with yourself. Yes. Have your best saved days, faithful days, have they passed by? I was really faithful back then. We've got a situation happening here. We got a problem. We got a sickness. There's some gangrene here, and we got to deal with it. No, as you get older, as we grow in grace, church, we become more faithful. Yes. This is not about you never sinning, but watch this. As you grow in grace, this is about sinning less and less and less and less. As you come into the knowledge of, as you come into the grace, of, when you listen, as we realize what Jesus did for us on the cross, it does something in our hearts that we start saying, God, yes. Lord, I want to live for you because of what you've yes. done. For me. Yes. When they used to, old preachers used to say, I thank God He put food on my table. Thank God He woke me up this morning, started me on my way. My young foolish self, I said, Oh man, what's a cliches? But now as I have been living, I am so glad. So glad. Every day he wakes me up, I'm so glad. Every day he gives me another opportunity, I'm so glad. And when my money is low and there's food on my eye, I, I, I get so glad. And that grace is what helps me to learn to sin less and less. Amen. Amen. Not being perfect, but just obeying God and all that He's called us to. Absolutely. 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 Church, listen, this holiness is important to God because that means He can use you. He can use you. Yes. And sometimes, church, God cannot use us because we don't make ourselves available for Him. That's true. We don't make ourselves available. If you play, Lord, I'm available, Michael. We don't make ourselves available to Him. And God wants us to be available all the time. And sometimes, church, we just got to, we got to amputate some things. We, do, we have to cut some things off. We got to cut some people off. We got to cut some things out. Not, this is not legalism. This is just saying, God, I want to obey you yes. now. Thank you.